So we're going to have a lecture on sampling that is more useful as not necessarily LDA and NMFF, but how do you go by doing sampling, implementing a basic sampling. So um, how many people here know, or anybody knows what sampling with replacement? What does that mean? Yes. Every time you uh, pick a sample, you can actually pick it up again. Meaning, if I am to pick a student, but I want to pick 20 students, what do I do? I pick a student, and then you pick the remaining 90. I, I reconsider that student the second time I sample. That's good replacement. Every time I pick a student, I'm not taking the student out of the room, as opposed to sampling without replacement, which is every time I already sample a student, I'm not sampling that student again. So suppose I do uniform sampling, which means what? Uniform sampling, either with replacement or without replacement. Hmm? I only have students. I don't have a distribution. I have here, I have 50 students. I want to sample uniformly. What does that mean? Yes? What? So I, I have 50 students. I want to pick 10 students. Say. And I want to pick them uniformly. What does uniformly mean? Everybody has the same chance of being selected. Uniform. Right? So don't be confused between replacement without replacement or uniform, not uniform. They both four, four things can happen. You can sample uniformly with replacement, uniformly without replacement, non-uniformly with replacement, and non-uniformly without replacement. Right? Uniform means everybody has the same chance of being selected. Non-uniform means that different probabilities of being selected. Right? And with replacement, without replacement means once I select something, I will have that, that, that object available for the next samples. So, if I'm to select words from English alphabet, and I want to generate text, I'm making a parenthesis here, right, before I move on to this stuff. If I want to select text to generate, uh, select words independently, to generate text that looks like English, should I sample with replacement or without replacement? So I want to sample a word, put it there, Sample another word, put it next. Another word, put it next. I do it independently, so I'm, I'm adding another concept. I, I, I'm talking a little bit about sampling now, which is a diversion for what's coming. Just to set up a little bit of expectation on the background, because I want to have this conversation for 10 minutes to be clear what I expect you guys to know next week when we talk about sampling. So there is replacement or without. There is uniform or not, and there is independent or not. Right? So we said what's replacement or without replacement. Either I do consider that object again or not. Uniform or not uniform means everybody has equal probabilities or not. How about independent or not? What does that mean? Suppose I, I sample students. What does it mean to be independent? I still want to sample 10 students, right? So I pick one person. Independent means what? The second time, I do it independently of who got selected the first time. Dependent means I do it with some sort of connection or dependency of who got sampled the first time. So suppose I want to sample words for text. Now, I'm not going to generate proper English text. There's no way to sample words and automatically generate some, some English text. Although some students at MIT did that. They came up with a sampling strategy that just generates words and it looks like English. They've got generated a fake paper accepted at a conference. It's generated by a computer, totally. And they, they, they want to make a point how bad the conference is. 
right? So that's what they did. They came up with the computer system, generates words and math formulas, and puts them there with heavy, heavy dependencies. It doesn't look like random. And uh, they say, hey, my automatic computer can produce papers now. Okay. So uh, if I want to generate words and create some sort of text that looks like English, should it be independent or not? Hmm? Not, independent. not independent. Once I pick some words, some the next word, it's it's far more likely to be something other than that. That's how this typing word predictions work like, right? Where once you type a few words, they, they have a very good idea what the next word might be. Good. Should it be uniform or not when I select the words? No, because some words in English are, are much more common than other words, right? Should it be with replacement or not? Once I pick a word and I start generating text, can I pick that word again? Yes. yes. Okay. So my expectation for next week is that you're going to have a pretty good idea of replacement without replacement and uniform, not uniform, what those are. And perhaps the version that's uh, uniform, you could implement yourself. If I tell you to do it uniformly, either with replacement or without replacement, I think you can write that program. Uniform is very easy, right? Whatever the pool of candidates are, I pick one at random. How about if I say not uniform with replacement? Could you implement that version? say words or objects or whatever. Like, doesn't matter what we sample for the sampling algorithm. It could be images, could be words, could be documents, could be people. If I tell you, I give you a, a, a probability distribution over 20 news groups or over the MNIST data set. I tell you some images have to have higher probabilities than other images. So when I say not uniform, a density or distribution is required. On uniform, it's not. It's one over n for everybody when n is how many things are. But when it's not uniform, you have to specify what the probability, sampling probability for each object is. Like in English, we know what is the probability for every word. Because we look at so much text, by now we know what are the probabilities. If you, if you have to implement a not uniform with replacement, do you think you can do it? How would you do it? You pick a number, right, between 0 and? For the, for the words. Times three, times cons. I think you, you want to, so what, if, if I have a PDF or a distribution of each uh, object, right, let's call that P for that object. The sum or the integral of those P objects have to be? How would I pick one? I would pick a number between 0 and 1 and figure out for my, this is my objects, they have different probabilities because this is not uniform. One would be very small, one would be high, another one would be small, small, high, high, very high, right? This could be like that. They sum to one total. So if I pick a random number between 0 and 1, that random number would be here. So I have to then find the object for which the random number was, was selected. And then since it's with replacement, what happens when I move to the next round? Nothing happens. I leave everything in place, and I do it the second time, the third time, the fourth time, fifth time, ten times, if I want to get a sample of ten images. Ends up is with me. So I expect you guys, not necessarily to implement it, but to know how, if I give you a distribution over 20,000 images, and I say I want 200 images from that distribution with replacement, that means a particular image can be selected more than once to be able to run that, that Python or Java program. Because I, once I design my sampling mechanism, I just repeat that 200 times. How about non-uniform without replacement? Would you do that? 
fair warning, this is a tricky question. There's a problem with our replacement. I have a sampling distribution over my images. I pick one, easy the first time. What happens the second round? Take it out, like it's gonna change the distribution. Changes the distribution. Maybe I can do some rescaling to make some to one, but that changes the distribution. So this is a little bit ill-defined. You have to specify exactly what you want. One specification is maintain the ratios. Objects that have been sampled are taken out, and then between the ones that are still remaining, I want to maintain the relative ratios between the sampling probabilities. That doesn't mean I maintain the actual sample probabilities. You have to think about that math a little bit. We'll, we'll do that next week. Another specification is to say, no, no, it, it doesn't matter to me what you're doing internally. How do you design this sampling mechanism? That's like a black box. What I want is each object in the very, very end, each object will be selected at most once, right? Because that's without replacement. So suppose I specify, I want this to be the overall sampling probability for your object. So suppose you sample students. I want this student to be sampled with that probability, this student with that probability, this student with that probability, so on and so forth, in a sample of 10 students. You achieve that. <coughs> this is a hard problem. People have thought about the statistics for 50 years how to solve this problem. Because sampling without replacement, it's very efficient for practical purposes. Imagine when people do polls for uh, estimating election results before the election, right? There's a lot of polls coming. Do you want to call somebody twice to ask who you're going to vote for? No. So what kind of sampling they do without replacement? They don't want to call the same person twice, right? But estimating from that, if, if, the, if it's not uniform, which is not, when I sample for election results, I don't want to, for, for statistical reasons that we're going to discuss next week, I do not want to sample uniformly. I want to sample non-uniformly. It's much more powerful estimation. But then how do I deal with the probabilities when I sample non-uniformly? There are entire books written on the subject. What's best approximation in different situations for sampling without replacement to obtain a given sampling distribution? It's not a problem that can be solved in close form. So that's why this approximation is unnecessary. And all of that, keep in mind, it doesn't even deal with this part. Everything we talked about so far, it's assuming there's no dependence, right? When I say sample for election or sample patients, sample with replacement or without, I'm not, I'm not getting into dependency issues. But in many problems like text, I have to deal with dependencies because text is very dependent. So perhaps we have heard of Markov chains, some of us. This is a very simple dependence that says, once you are in some state, there is a probability allowed for the next state, right? Things like that. And if we keep going on that idea, I would say, how do you model dependence? There are some pretty good sampling algorithms for particular problems. Very well-known one is the Gibbs sampler that applies to many distributions and allows us to, to generate multidimensional random variables without knowing the joint distribution of all those variables, if we can estimate the conditionals. That is what's being used in LDA, the Gibbs sample. So by next week, we're gonna get into the sampling strategy. I want to just give you a warning that some of this stuff will be necessary for the homework, but we won't be heavily discussed in class. Okay. So that's uh, our plan for, for the next uh, week and a half or so. Um, so what we're going to do is to talk a little bit about this and about this. Uh, maybe we span to next time. And um, I asked one of the PhD students we have in the lab to come today later on to give you guys uh, a demo on the comparison between those two things. Okay. Uh, so, with that being said, I'm going to show you some slides and discuss a little bit of the math between those things.
have an update on the uh, final exam? Oh yeah, so we're working to create the final exam. That's my plan, as I said. I don't have a, the, I, I saw the question, there's a question on Piazza, I think. Uh, the classes end where they end, like the per university register, I think it's April 20, 21, 19, right. usually something like that. If we have an exam, it will be scheduled during the uh, exam week. I think people are trying to buy plane tickets, is that it? Uh, yeah, I know. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, you can't leave on 20 after the last class anyway because if we don't have an exam there will be a homework that ends after that date so if the 20th is one on Wednesday what is it yeah so I think we're gonna have to have the last homework due a little bit over my plan is to have an exam but because these exams nobody knows how to do them the one I have in mind I'm working with some faculties and with other people to see, okay, can we do such an exam? Um, so I don't have, I, I have the problems that I want to ask you guys to solve, but I don't know how to manage the actual exam to make it work. What's reasonable, say, within four or five hours with your laptops to do, uh, and what, what kind of support we need to provide. If that doesn't work, we'll have a homework due after. I, I don't have a better update about that, but it, uh, we need to have it uh, soon if we were to do so. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, matrix factorization. somebody wants to use the projector and back the board and back the projector and back the board, how much fun would that be? <laughs> and it's not going to stay here that easy. Well, let's hope. <laughs> okay. So what do we want to do here? showed this today, uh, yesterday, last time. Uh, there's a matrix, in our case, the matrix would be documents by words, and we want to obtain those two things. Uh, last time, we said uh, we want, so you can hope for an exact factorization. In pure linear algebra terms, this relates to the rank. If you want an exa exact multiplication that gives this product, this K cannot be lower than the rank of matrix A. That's pretty easy to show, um, even on high school in algebra. But we are not looking for an exact factorization. We're looking for something close enough, just like PCA does. So in here, um, one option to say is that that's, that's very related to the regression type of error, right? We're saying what we want. We want this is the product, uh, and those are the cells, right? I and J, rows and columns. So I want the difference in the cells between the original values and this product values to be squared, to be uh, the sum as small as possible. We've seen this formula many, many times. So suppose I want that. Uh, is this the same like PCA? What, what's the... So the PCA, I think, has the same kind of notion, right? It, it minimizes the squares between something and something, or not? But that's the covariance 
Right, so what's the difference? I think the formula looks very similar in terms of the objective. It's a square difference, but the difference is not on, in a term document matrix, what is this? If A is documents by terms, what is AIJ? How many times the word appear, the word J appears in document I, right? If the, those counts sometimes are modified as per an information retrieval uh, method or NLP method, we don't use the TF, pure TF values, the documents. We say multiply with an IDF, or sometimes we asymptote those numbers. So the problem with the count is that words that are very common can give a very large count, right? Like the is the most common word in English can appear to a thousand times in the documents. What people do sometimes, they run an asymptote and say, okay, for the first few counts, I really count each count as a new occurrence, but after a while, I don't wanna count anymore linearly every occurrence as a count, so it asymptotes to somebody. Or I use an IDF to give importance. IDF is a function that tells how rare a word is. The, the bigger the IDF, the rare the word. Anyway, those are some related with counts, some, some values related with counts, and this is what I get. It's very different than, than PCA, because in PCA, this was a distance between things, right? The covariance we show, it's pretty close to the norm product, which is x times x transpose, so this would be the dif distance between i and j, those would be two objects. I don't know how many people remember that. So that's one thing, and that we mentioned already, but there is another version of it, KL divergence, okay? So um, I'm gonna show you in a second how that goes, and what, what's the difference between the two. So this uh, particular talk talks about exactly TF-IDF. This is a, a formula that says take the TF count, modify it, and multiply with an IDF which is purely a function of the terms. So IDF, it's a function of a word. It tells you how rare that word is. There are many versions of IDF, but they all achieve the same thing. A word that's very specific, like Virgil, will have a high IDF because it's rare. Uh, a word that is about or from or at or some common word like that would be very low IDF because it's a very common word. Okay? And uh, this is an example of how this could work. Uh, in here, in here uh, darker uh, cells indicates a higher TF value, and white is zero, perhaps. <coughs> Once I do this, I get the matrix W and H, right? So I obtain this intermediary hidden topics. Typically, this three is K is once we have to put on. There are some mechanisms for identify uh, K, but for us, we're not gonna we, we're gonna try to, to guess it by trying different values of K. And uh, here's before I get into technical details, I want to show you what these people did. So they have some examples for here's a bunch of news articles not too many, um, and here's the topics that are being obtained. So what we would like in a topic, I mentioned this last time, a topic is a little different for text than the clustering for K means each cluster was. We like the topic to have what technically we call coherence. In practice, we call making sense. We want a topic to not be a random amalgam of things that we don't understand what's about. So without, I'm gonna get into the details of the technical details in a second, but do these topics make sense? Assuming those are BBC articles, right? BBC is a premier news service from Britain, right? Uh, is this a coherent thing? How about this? Right? Even even without knowing the documents, right? Even without knowing the documents, we could look at those topics with our eyes and without 
you know, perhaps nobody is a Britain national in this class. And yet, just with a vague knowledge about Britain and about their, their, their economy and, you know, stuff that's on, on, on the public knowledge, we can tell that this is a quite different topic than this, and they are rather coherent. So we want this, uh, especially if you have to use this topic explicitly, like say for summarization, we don't want those topics to be like in neural networks, completely hidden values that are a mystery, we don't understand them. Neural networks are very powerful at detecting the right uh, weights or structure or hidden layers for whatever purpose we have. If I have a face recognition problem, that's what the image is now text, but even if I have a text prediction problem, neural networks will be better than topic model. They will do a better job in terms of accuracy. They're also very efficient to implement. But they are extremely hard to understand the internal layers of a neural network. Let's try one more. Um, this is, I think, from Ireland. Same thing about, that, that's a lot more, 21,000 news articles. I don't think this is, a, the 20 news groups, but the number is similar. Uh, those, um, we don't see the whole thing. Okay. How about those topics? Are they coherent? Right, so let's see, uh, we, we know what Dublin is? Capital. Capital, okay, that's fine. Um, we don't know what Christopher Mueller is, but maybe we can Google him up to see what he is. I don't know, I don't know him. Anybody knows who this guy is? Um, but uh, we know about Northern Ireland, that that's a problem. The British fought with the Irish people for centuries, and they came up with this uh, Northern Ireland is still part of UK while the rest of Ireland is an independent country, right? That, that we know, yeah. mostly, right? <laughs> that, okay, it's like India and Pakistan, and this is like, what's that road? It's Kashmir, right? It's kind of like that. For the people coming from that side of the world, we can have that interpretation. Fought for centuries, figured out the border. But uh, as opposed to Pakistan and India, Relations have settled down fully now. There's all full economic cooperation crossing the border and all that. Everybody's friends. Was that last summer? What? I was there last summer. Yeah, now with the new Brexit thing, I think there's some problems there that needs to be figured out. Okay, I, I think this makes some sense, but I, like you, you guys say, uh, it's not as coherent and easy to understand. Um, but this at least, for example, it's clearly a European thing. When they try to make Europe a federal country like United States, they have a Lisbon Treaty uh, that require referendums all over Europe to change constitutions because they want to federalize Europe. All countries rejected it with high margins, so that didn't work. Um, I'm from Europe, so I know more about that. Uh, let's see. How about IMDb data set? What's IMDb about? Movies. 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 Okay, so we all watch a lot of movies. Uh, are these coherent? Topic number one, what is this about? Westerns. Exactly. It's clearly the old cowboys and horses shooting, right? Big hats. Uh, how about this? Police, detective, murders, so on and so forth. So this is a good example of coherent topics. How about the number? Is five the right number for movies? IMDb has a lot of movies. And suppose I'm not, I'm not an expert. If you are a movie critic and you, you're willing to make very, very subtle details between Lord of the Rings 1 and Lord of the Rings 2, I mean, that's good for you, but most people are not subtle reviewers on IMDb. So for them, it's mostly a big categorization. Grand genres. For grand genres, would be would be this enough? Do you think? Is there any obvious genre that's missing from here? Is there oh, only big movies that are not fitting in any one of those? Right. So I think they pick a bunch of action movies, right? 
and they only wore the action movies because as far as I, I looked at this before the class, I was like superheroes, police, martial arts, gun points and gangs and, and cowboys, but there's, my mom wouldn't like any of them, right? <laughs> right? She can't stand shooting of any kind. Okay. Um, there's more. How about now? Do we have romantic comedies? Where is that? Topic number eight, right? <laughs> so it's ten, ten the right number of topics to. How do you do this? See, with k means you have to rely purely on objective functions, right? How do you fix the k? You run a k, you see what the objective does, you see what the similarity does, you see who's with who, but you usually run those functions. Unless you have labels. When you have labels, evaluation becomes a lot more easy with, with actual labels. But with k means usually you have to rely on the numbers. The topic modelists have the advantage that you probably want to look at your topics as opposed to run all kinds of functions, right? So should we make k bigger or smaller here? So what, when would we make it bigger? Again, we're not measuring with algebraic functions. We, we're thinking with our heads and what we know about movies. When some obvious movies are missing, right? Okay, and when would they make it smaller? Where's the case too big? When? Where some topics are extremely similar. Is that happening in here? Some topics are extremely similar? Or are there some obvious topics that are missing? How about horror movies? Are, are in here horror movies? <laughs> Topic seven is horror movies? I think this is related to horror movies, and I, I didn't watch many horror movies, but I'm guessing that's not, a lot of the movies in here are actually not horror movies, that's my guess. Um, and I think this is a little uh, too vague. What movies are about New York City's, obviously Manhattan is the New York City nightclub, marriage proposal, hotels, party engagement. I, I think this is not clear what, what kind of movies fit in here. I, I mean, the one with the cowboys and shooting seems a much more clearly specified topic that's about. So I think what you want to do is to try this on a data set and then figure out what topics you have and decide what to do with that K and other parameters that may come into play. Um, there is a Python uh, thing that I think most people would use, NMF. Uh, you can use other implementations, but this is the one that I think most of you will do. Now, so that's an interesting story. That's all based on NMF, not on LDA. So uh, how does it work? In particular, I was looking at these uh, update rules in here. I think we didn't see all the slides. This is the algebraic version that says, I want to minimize the differences. And they have these formulas. You repeat this. This is kind of an EM type of algorithm. I, I, I update H, and then given the update of H, I update W. Those are the two matrices. And I keep doing that until I'm good. I looked at this, and I added those T's in here, because uh, without the T's, it didn't make sense. I digged up the, the paper where this is coming from. So one thing is, how do we get these updates, right? The other thing is, how do we know that by doing those updates, we're going to be in a good state? Like in k-means, we can't promise any sort of global optimum. Uh, this, this is not convex. This objective is not convex in both w and h, but it's convex in one if the other one is fixed. In other words, if you look at this function, A is fixed. A is the original matrix. If I fix W, then this function is convex in H. 
h being the variable, which means I can run an update to get the best h, either a gradient descent or some other update. If I have a convex objective, I know how to differentiate it and, and, and go towards the minimum value by following the differential. But I need to update for both of those things, right? They're both variables. So like in EM, I have this problem of if I knew one, I could immediately update the other, but I don't know any one of them perfectly. So it's an iterative set of updates that says update H, and once you got a better H, then you get a bit better W, and back and forth between H and W. But what happens, the <coughs> convergence, so to speak, it's guaranteed same like in k-means. Do you remember what happened in k-means? Every time I redo the k, the, the step, the k-means step, I was decreasing the objective. Same thing will happen here. If there's a theorem that says if you repeat this thing, the objective will keep decreasing, which means at some point it's going to stop. This objective is obviously positive, and it's it's going to converge to some value. If you keep decreasing, the only way to do that is to slowly converge to some value. It's not guaranteed to be the global optimum value, but we take it. So as a side discussion for what this is and how it works, here's a paper that's, I think, from 20 years ago, something, that described this, this property. Right, so this is V instead of A, but still I want to do WH. This is the rule that's being used there. It's written with one sum, but it's a sum over all I and J is the same exact difference, difference of all cells squared. And this is the ones we're going to look at in a second. It's the KL distance, so we'll talk about that in a second. But for now, let's look at this distance. What these people do here, this is a famous paper now because of this non-negative matrix factorization. Um, so suppose I want to do the algebraic objective, which is minimize the, the square two norm of the difference of matrices. These are the update rules. So the ones in the paper didn't make sense to me, but when I read this, I realized they missed the transpose on these matrices. H times H transpose wouldn't make sense if it wouldn't be for the transpose in there. So these update rules are exactly the ones in the other PDF. And this is the update rules for the other objective, the KL distance. But what's going on here? How do they think about this? They say, we're going to take the gradient descent, the one that we did in plus. And what we're going to do, we're going to scale, they call it diagonal scaling, we're going to scale the update by much larger numbers than gradient descent says. So that's their kind of novelty when they published this paper. Everybody knew about gradient descent. What happens with this uh, eta? So the, the point, the major point, technical point of this paper is the rescaling. What they prove, this is the other, the other objective. So the paper is only up to here. Essentially says, take the gradient descent and rescale. They show two things, that if we take the gradient, uh, gradient descent and rescale the updates with these etas, I get that method, meaning this. I get this, this update. But the mathematical critical part is to say, that if we do this, we maintain the property that the objective is decreasing. Theorem one. I think I missed it. So the decreasing, it's right there, that word non-increasing. What they can promise is that with these new update rules, the objective is not going to increase. But there's more. It's invariant, meaning it remains constant, only if I reached 
uh, local optimum. Now, of course, we're not going to go over these proofs, but I, I, I want you to have at least an idea of how this stuff works. Um, this is on a PhD level uh, realm. But when you have such a thing, what, what are we looking for in a method that does something like that? Right? In an implementation sense, uh, what happens in Python, the, the problem is engineering. How do I deal with transposes and divisions and all that? Uh, in some other cases, I also have matrix inverse, like you had in the PCA. I have to deal with the inverse. That's one side of things. The other side of things, when you go to any data science real problems, like either research or industry, you're going to have to say, OK, how do I derive these updates? That's why they have here in these papers. I start with gradient descent, and I rescale the diagonal. But then how do I prove that by rescaling, I'm still maintaining the non-increasing distance property? So you can think of data science engineer as two kinds of efforts. There is the conceptual and mathematical effort that says, here's why you need those updates, and here's the proof that by doing it, you end up somewhere good. And then there's an engineering part of it. OK, how do I take this and, and, and write it as a program? So that's what the NMF package is. I think there's plenty of them. MATLAB has it too. Um, that's what that is. Now, about the other part, uh, which is this, we need to talk a little bit on the board first. What is KL distance? So first of all, what is, so say P is a distribution over N objects. So sum from I equal 1 to N of PI has to be 1. What is the entropy? Of that distribution? I think we said this already, right? What is it? Sum of pi log of one over pi, and this entropy measures randomness. The higher this value is, the more random the distribution is. Extremes are what's the most random? Which one's the most? The the n is fixed here. I have fifty students. What's the most random distribution? Uniform. What's the least random? One student has 100%. The other ones have zero. In each case, the entropy for that will be? Zero. It's a limit, really, because I can't do zero technically. But the limit when P goes to 1, it goes to 1, the other goes to 0, the limit of that thing is a 0. There is something called, now I have another distribution. Another distribution over the same and objects. So now this one, some also the one. So there is a notion that some of you may not heard of cross entropy. Um, that is called PQ, I think, this way. And it's the sum over PI log of PI divided by QI. Unfortunately, people in statistics use this notation for two definitions. That's one of them, called cross entropy. The other one, which is the very different than this, is the joint entropy. That is the, the joint entropy is the randomness of the pair of two variables together. One variable is by P, the other one by P. We're not going to talk about that now. I'm just warning you that when you type this, you might get joint entropy. That's not the concept we want. We want this cross entropy. 
So what is cross entropy? Just technically, if I if I open up that log, log of a fraction is what? I think this comes at log of pi, log of pi this way, right? Um, maybe qi or one over qi minus pi log of one over correct because the, the minus uh, reverses the log, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think so this of course is whole. That's the entropy of P. And this in here is the KL distance. Let me see if I get this right. KL distance between P and Q. KL distance has this funny notation. They don't put a comma, but this sign is definitely acts like a comma. Just put this, these two bars. Um, I'll make sure I got this correct. As far as I remember, there's some. Does it work now? I don't know if you guys are following me. This is the definition of the cross entropy, which is pi log of 1 over qi. And I'm saying this is the sum of two things. It's the sum of this. I, I added the pi, but then I take it out here. Because when I, when I put this sum back together, pi is a common factor. Log plus log is what? Log of the product. The product will be pi divided by qi divided by pi, so that's 1 over qi, right? This is the KL distance, and this is just the entropy of p. Right? It's uh, just, it's just one over qi, it's just q. What? I'm missing a term here? Entropy of P is this, right? The first term. The first term? Is missing something? Not this? Uh, you know. What? 
I can't hear what you're saying. Uh, well, it's this one here, right? Isn't that the same as that? Because minus log of Q is log of 1 over Q. Okay? Are we all on the same page here? So this, for me, this is what I want to show you. I want to give you the definition of the KL distance, but I don't want to just put it on the board like that. Who's going to make sense of what this is? If I just say the KL distance is that formula. Does that mean anything to you? But this way, it means something, right? KL distance is the difference between the entropy of P and the cross entropy of P and Q. Do we know what the entropy of P means? How random? P is. P is. But what is this? Cross entropy. What is that? This comes from the coding theory. This, your intuition about this should be, I never remember the formulas. I, you, as you could tell, I, I don't remember what the right formula is. But I remember what those values mean, and you should follow my example. Trying to remember the formulas is pointless. You're going to make a mistake. Better Google them out. But remembering what they mean, that's what matters. This is a formula for randomness. This is a formula that says if you encode things based on the P distribution, how much more effort is going to take if the actual objects come from the Q distribution? So encoding theory, if you know the distribution of what you're encoding, words or people or data or whatever, to send, say, over a channel. But encoding works even for cell phones. When you talk, they have to encode the signal to send it digitally over a channel to the other side and decode it on the other side. This has to do with if you encode based on P distribution, but the data comes from Q distribution, how many more bits do you need to correct for the fact that you got the distribution wrong? That's the cross entropy. So the difference is the KL distance, which is easy to tell that if this is equal to that, if Q, if Q and P are the same distribution, the, the KL distance will be zero. zero. However, this is not symmetric. So if you look at Q versus P, this is not the same as P versus Q. So in that sense, it's not a distance in a, in a geometrical sense. The distances are supposed to be symmetric. The distance from here to New York is the same as the distance from New York to here. That's not true for this. So I don't want to make this class about the, 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 the distributions, but the basic stuff about distributions, entropy, cross entropy, and KL distance, you're going to have to know. Because not just this, a lot of machine learning uses this as, as objectives. So now what these people did here, how does the work, how, how does get, this get transformed into a KL distance? Why is this related to the KL distance? First of all, technically, is this formula AIJ, log of AIJ by BIJ the same as the KL distance? Yes. yes. But what's up with the sum of AIJ and sum of BIJs? This is, this is including the sum? If this would be distributions, the sum of AIJs would be 1 for every row, and the sum of BIJs will be 1 for every row, so they'll go away. But they want to they want to define it in a more general sense when I don't necessarily have distributions. Now back to the original, who's A? What is A? A-I-J. If this is document I, this is what? The word in that document will count. So now if I normalize this to think of it as a distribution, every document is a distribution over words, then I'm going to get this sum of AIJs and BIJ going away here. So I'm ended up with a, with a KL distance. Right? Um, the reason this is it done this way, because sometimes I don't want to normalize further than TFI, DFI. 
there are machine learning tools who normalize the documents count by DL, which is the number of words, document length. If I normalize the counts by document length, do I get the distribution? So suppose I have TF, simple TF counts, and the, the total number of words in a document is 1,000. I divide by the sum. Do I get the distribution? I do, right? So in that case, this will be acting exactly like distributions, but sometimes I don't want to divide by the document length, and then I need a more general formula. The rest of this method goes the same. If I want to do this instead, I'll have to apply the same terminology I did here, aka create some updates, and then prove mathematically that those updates minimize my objective, right? To a local minima, I cannot promise, this is also not convex, so I cannot promise a global uh, solution. But I can run EM style updates until I get as decreased as possible with this object. So those are here, right? Here's the formulas for, for that version. <laughs> and uh, there's also a proof that this works. I'm not interested in the proof. What I'm interested in, why do I need two methods, two objectives? Why would they bother? This is topic modeling. Now we're thinking about topic models, right? This is a general non-negative matrix factorization technique. Those people didn't talk about topic models. But now we do topic models. What should I do? What do I want? Am I interested? This is preserving what? The cells themselves, right? AIJ is the count, and this is the new count. So I want the counts to be as close as possible. This is preserving what? Hmm? Distribution, implied distribution by the topics of documents over the words, right? So. If this one is saying if a document was about that, that, and that, some proportion, I still want to be with that proportion the same as before. So it's, it's, it's a very, these are not connected mathematically. It's not like if I run some certain choices of parameters, I get that function. Those are very different functions. Right? So I would guess right now that if I want to preserve the aspect of documents, maybe this makes more sense than the counts, right? Uh, as we said at PCA, a square function has the property that penalizes big objects much more than small objects, right? Um, so in a, in a, whatever this AIJ is small and BIJ, BIJ is relatively small, that would be a non-significant penalty. Even if BIJ is a hundred times bigger than AIJ, if that's small and they're small, the difference is not that big. But when one of them is big, when, when some particular term has a high count, and the estimate is not close to it, that would be a big penalty. So that is the NMF. Um, so I think we, we're going to ask uh, Kitchen here to, to talk about things. LDA versus NMF. Before he does that, I want to recap a little bit LDA. Maybe we don't remember it from last time, but LDA, the technical parts of LDA, will come on Wednesday. Um, LDA goes in a different way, and we're going to have to talk. The, the part of NMF, it's relatively easy. If we understand the product of matrices, and we understand that these updates come from some derivations, that's relatively easy. In here, to understand how LDA goes, we need more statistics. That's why we're going to have to spend more time on it. I don't know if you remember last time we have some sort of master formula like this on the board. There are many versions of it, so this is a slightly different version. Why is it that in this joint, these massive joints, sometimes you see something with sums and sometimes you see nothing with sums? How come those joints 
sometimes generate some in them. Where's the sum coming? Products, back up a little bit. Products come from where? Why in a joint I have a product of things? I multiply probabilities, right, in an independence assumption. Assuming all the documents are independent, you get the product of things. Assuming all the topics are independent, I get the product of topics. Assuming all the words are independent in the document, I get the product of words. Where's the sum coming from? If you ever see a joint, not just this joint, this is a joint of many parameters, uh, topics, documents, whatever it's in there. Why would I see a sum in the joint like that? Where the sums come from? Sum probabilities maximizing the that, that's a good point. Some probabilities come in one, but that's not usually why sums come in. Sums come in when we have an unknown state, hidden variables, and what we want to do is called marginalization over the hidden variables, right? We have, we have a bunch of options, and we don't know. We have only probabilities for each option. We don't know what option it is, right? And then to get the marginal, to, to take out that variable, say z sometimes, it's called the hidden variable. If you want to take them out, like not depend on z anymore, what happens in the joint, we have to marginalize over all possible z's. That's when we get a sum in. So we, we're going to have to talk a lot more about this on Wednesday, how that actually goes. So that's one thing that's not so immediately clear. I think everybody, like me, has a better sense of what the matrix factorization does than what, what this product here does. So we're going to need some digging to, to, to figure this out. But then, another thing that we need that's also complicated as opposed to NMF is why are we picking particular, why are we making these choices of distributions that are made here? LDA works exactly with these choices. So multinomial distribution. And then uh, there's another one that's even harder than uh, multinomial. So why are we making those choices? Because we are guessing how documents work with, with words. Before I, I talk about multinomial, what happens when I flip a coin? I get the heads or the tail. Not necessarily 50-50, if I have a fake coin, it may be 70% heads, right? What kind of distribution is that? When I flip one coin once, I get the probability over heads, one over tail. Everybody knows the name of that distribution? Bernoulli. Bernoulli. What happens if I flip it 10 times? Binomial. binomial. Well, how is the binomial distribution related to this one here? Binomial is what? N choose K, right? Sum over N choose K x at k, y at n minus k, right? That's the binomial x and y is being heads or tails. How many heads, how many tails I got? Well, this one is the same, except it's not just heads and tails. My coin now has how many faces? D faces. So this is also n. n is what in those throw out the coin in the air, what is n? Right. How many trials, how many times I throw the coin in the air? And you should know, this is required for this class and for you as computer scientists, if I throw a coin in the air a hundred times, what's the distribution of heads versus tails? Binomial distribution. And those are the binomial coefficients. Do we know that? Well, what happens if I throw a coin in the air that doesn't have two faces, heads and tails, has D faces? I get a multinomial distribution. And do we recognize these being related to N choose K? What is that? What's N choose K? N factorial, K factorial, N minus K factorial. Well, that's if I have two two heads and tails, but what if I have R, blue, and green, three faces? It would be N factorial divided by number of R's factorial, number of blues factorial, number of green factorial. Those are these excites, the counts, how many R's I got, how many blues, and how many reds. Right? 
And the sum of the counts, of course, has to be the number of trials, because every time I throw the coin in the air, I get R, blue, or green. How many people follow? So I just defined the multinomial distribution for you in terms of the binomial distribution, which is exactly the same thing if I have D faces as opposed to two faces. The coefficient is this thing here, and then the product is this product here. Right? Wait, the plot thickens with this LDA thing. That's one thing. We need to understand multinomial distribution. Another thing is, D is going to be the size of the vocabulary. Like, I don't have just three faces. I have 20,000 faces, one for each word. And now I'm generating words from the multinomial distribution by flipping a coin with 20,000 faces getting a word. We need to know one more thing that we're going to do Wednesday about Bayesian theorem. In Bayesian theorem, we have something like Don't worry about now what's, what's data and what's x. x is data, theta is the parameters. This is called a prior. I think you guys know that. This thing right here is called a prior. And this is called a posterior, maybe? No, something. Doesn't matter the name. It turns out it's easy to do these kind of things if this and the prior have the same algebraic form. So we need, given the likelihood distribution, that we know it's multinomial because we think of text as coins flipped in the air that generate words. You can say that's crazy. I agree. But 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 we fix a model, right? We like in Gaussian, when we say the data is Gaussian, it doesn't mean we write. We just make an assumption. That's the assumption we're making here. Text follows a multinomial distribution over words. If this is multinomial, we want this thing to have the same algebraic form, and that's typical in Bayesian inference. And to do this, we have to pick a certain distribution for theta that allows this. And that distribution depends on the assumption we made here. It turns out for multinomial distributions, the prior that gives this magic property, it's called Dirichlet. So Dirichlet is the prior that, given the multinomial assumption, has the same algebraic form. Now, Dirichlet is not so bad. He looks very bad, but it's not that bad. Because this gamma function is just the factorial. When somebody says gamma and you're not a mathematician, you cut gamma and put factorial. So what's gamma of 3? 6. OK, 1 times 2 times 3. If you know mathematics, you don't do that. Okay. Mathematicians get very upset. But we are not mathematicians. We're computer scientists. So if somebody says gamma, Boom, we replace with the factorial. So that's what gamma is, okay? Factorial. So that's not so bad, right? This looks like the familiar multinomial. The gamma is the factorial. That's n factorial right there. And those are the factorials of the chunks, right? Looks like the multinomial a little bit. And so given this other thing that we have to understand, conjugate priors, why is the Dirichlet the conjugate prior of the multinomial? Presumably, stuff starts working out. Meaning, as making those two assumptions, we're going to estimate the parameters we need in this model here. Now, to do that, we need one more thing, which is the optimization technique. Like, how do we make in making this assumption? We, we estimate the parameters. You can do it via EM types of alternative updates, but that's no good. So people came up with a sampling technique that will do that, estimate that. So another piece that we're going to need for this is how to do sampling, which is what we taught in the beginning. And we particularly going to need this, because we don't want independent sampling for text. We want dependent sampling. So we're going to have to talk about this Gibbs sampler a little bit. Your homework will have a sampling problem in it, implement sampling for this event. So uh, Ketchum, you want to? Yeah. You have an HDMI port in there?
Christian, by the way, is an expert at TensorFlow. Catch him. So he can debug your, your TensorFlow implementations. So we have both NMF and NMDM? Yes. We have about 20 minutes. I'm going to show you guys some real examples um, of what Virgil just taught in class. Um, so we know topic model can discover some ab abstract, abstract topics um, that occurs in the collections of documents. And usually the main outputs of topic models are two uh, distributions. So for example, in NMI, uh, the outputs are two matrices. Uh, one is the topic work distribution. The other is the document topic distribution. Um, so and here, this visualization tool can help us to better understand our output from topic model and can give us some global perspective. Um, so first, like, let's go take a look at the left panel here. Um, we plot those topics um, in the left panel. So the coordinates of these topics here is uh, we run PCA on the um, topic worst distribution matrix, and we only keep top two dimensions. And these top two features are X and Y. Um, so after we plot those topics, uh, we can see um, if two circles are very close, say uh, six and eight, so we can see uh, some words show up in both topics, which means that at least two topics are very similar. And if we look at another topic here, it's totally different. We have a lot of numbers here in this topic. Um, and the other uh, visual feature here is the, the area of the circle is proportional to the um, prevalence of this topic. It means the larger circle here, uh, the more popular this topic in the corpus the document. Uh, we can see here, so 10% means um, if the shape of circle is like this, it, com it comprises 10% of the, uh, this topic comprises 10% of the document, of the corpus. Um, um, yes. And uh, for the right panel, uh, if we look at uh, going to a topic, um, so now, uh, if we set lambda equals to one, we run those terms. So these are top terms in this topic. The way we run those terms are based on the um, term frequency here, the width of the right bar. And also, we can set different lambda here. If we set lambda zero, it's a different way to run these terms. So basically, it's based on the formula here. Maybe it's too small. But uh, this, this way to run those terms um, is based on both the um, estimated term frequency. Uh, actually, it's normalized by the term frequency. If we see a term is globally um, frequent, we don't want to assign a high weight for this term because this term may be just a uh, stop force. So we see it everywhere. So we can normalize this, uh, this score based on the term frequency. And uh, based on user study, 
uh, usually we cited 0.6, which can give us the most interpretable result. Um, yeah, and uh, here we can see uh, this result is from 20 new corpus. So I run RDA with uh, 10 topics and uh, five iterations. We can see the result is not pretty good. So this is because for RDA, uh, we need a good pro processing. Because the assum assumption for RDA is if we assign uh, equal prior for those words, uh, then we assume those words have equal contribution to the topics, to discovering the to discover the topics. But it always obviously wrong in the real world. For example, uh, for those stop words, we don't want to say those stop words in the in this top occur in the topics. Uh, it's useful. It's not useful for us. So we need some better pro better pro processing, pre processing. Yeah. Here's another result here. So yeah. So first, if we go through these topics, we can see um, there are all some stop words or some like numbers. Uh, we cannot find any um, useful topics here. And for this one, uh, the difference is I filter out stop words and punctuations. Um, and after we did that, we can see we can find some meaningful topics. For example, uh, uh, oh, yeah, like this. If we see the top words like God, Jesus, Bible, so this uh, looks better than the uh, the last one. So this is LDA. Uh, the LDA. On what data? Um, Twenty years. It's the same one like I think I showed last time in class. Right. And uh, so next, let's take a look at the result on based on NMF, then compare it with RDA. So, yeah. So for NMF, we can have two different input metrics. One is based on term frequency features. The other is based on TF idea. Uh, if we compare the re so this is on continuous corpus, and uh, yeah, the first one is based on term frequency, and the second one is based on TFIDF. If we compare these two results, we can see TFIDF can give us more reasonable outputs because here we see a lot of numbers, stop words, and some. Um, Meaning this force, so because this is based on only based on term frequency. Um, after we use TF idea, we can downweight those words because although they are very popular, they occur many times in the corpus, but they are not useful for us to discover those topics. Um, and then, if we compare the result between the NMF model and the RDA model. The same. So in, the, in RDA, because as I just mentioned, we have assumption uh, all the input all the input words have the same contribution to discover those topics. Uh, if we and in RDA we don't consider any TF idea feature, so we still can find those topics like this. It's not very help, uh, not very useful, um, but it looks better than the. Uh, TF version that I have. We can see some topics like here, like topic two here with topic one. These two, um, there's some overlap between these two <coughs> results. Yeah. So yes, the ranking is based on the um, the. The probability, the probability of this term given this topic. So it's right, this actually, 
when lambda equals to one here, just based on those rise bars, the width of the red bar. You asking about the ranking of words in the topic or the ranking of topics? Of topics. He's topics asking what topics. Oh yeah, this random. So yeah. So topic zero is not the one that's the biggest circle? No. no. Uh, so also we can see this RDA model result is better than I just showed in the visualization. This is because I also said the in the code uh, we can see maximum DF and minimum DF here, which means um, I filter out those words uh, it's very high frequency, the globally frequent in the document, and also I filter out some rare words. So before I input, before I pass in those words into RDA model, I did some pre-processing. So I think in your homework you need to do those things. And also it would be good to to lemmatization first. You don't uh, pass in the row terms. You do lemmatization, you filter stop words and punctuations, and you put them, you make it lowercase. I think, yeah, this is basically what you need to do before you pass, in, you pass it into the RDA model. So, but, but about that, we don't want to get too far into the NLP. Okay. Uh, we'll probably, they can call some functions to do that, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So but if you don't do this, you can see from the visualization. Yeah. Right. So the punctuation and um, and uh, weird words are easy to filter out. Lemmatization, like stemming, truncating words to the to the uh, uh, to the prefix, right? Um, that that's a hard problem. You, you don't want to take on that yourself. So you probably want to call some function of that as for you. Yeah. And those kind of things are discussed in an NLP course. Yes, but it's very helpful to get a better result. I mean, if you cannot get good result, you can try this. Um, also, uh, I try to run these two models on another data set, which is F FOMC data set. It's about the, uh, so these documents are meeting transcripts. So people group together to talk about the monetary policy. So in this way, you, you may want some topics about like discount rate or um, some thing about economy, yes. Uh, so as before, if we say the, uh, if we compare the NMF result, this one, with the RDA result here, we can see some words like Green Book or M2, M1, they dominate dominate those topics. So this is because, so these are keywords for this meeting, for this FOMC meeting. So it, you know, uh, we know that the RDA um, is based on the co-occurrence of the the word co-occurrence. So if two words always co-occur, and we uh, uh, we put them in the same topic. So because this this words like Green Book and M2 are very popular, they occur everywhere in the document, in the meeting. So if we don't filter them out, they show up in all the all those topics. They dominate the topics. Um, but if we use TFID, if we consider TFIDF feature, like when we use it in NMF model, we don't see the same thing because uh, the TFIDF downweight those words. So if you, if in your homework you see something happen like this here, some words dominate, you may want to filter out all these words before you run the model. So 
here in this conference, I guess the NMF gave us a better result compared with LDA. We see some, uh, and uh, we see so NMF, the one in Python? Yeah, uh, I skipped on. So we can use the visualization tool to help us to understand those outputs. And also, uh, the other way to evaluate this result is the quantitatively, uh, we can use the topic coherence score. Um, so let me show an example. So, for example, we have two, we got two topics, uh, we got two topics like this. One, the, uh, the top five words are like this. So one is God, Jesus, Bible, blah, blah. The other is Game. And uh, we can compute the topic coherence score. So the idea of it is um, so if we say the, um, if we say some words occur co-occur in the uh, if we say two words co-occur in the same document, if they usually co-occur in, in one document, then this topic is very coherent. So for example, if in the like in 20 news, if it's a sport news, we may say sport like, and football. These two terms are always co-occur in the same document, in one document. Um, so and the way to evaluate, to compute it is, uh, we use the frequency, uh, we count the documents which contain the word W. So DW means we, uh, we count the document, uh, number of documents which, uh, which contain the word W. And we compute it based on this. So it's the co occurrence over the um, the count of this word occurring in the document. Um, so if the number is large, then these two words are always co-occurring in the same document. Then let's go back here. So if we, have, if we want to evaluate the quality of these two topics, uh, we can compare the topic We can compare two topic coherence score. So, the larger topic coherence score is the better topic, the better quality. So here, we see the the second topic better than the first one because we got a large, a larger topic coherence score, which means those words are always co-occur in one in the same document, but those words are not. So this is another way to evaluate your topic model. Basically, all about RDA model. So, do you have any questions? So, this coherence is like saying, in effect, uh, if you have a topic that's with words from all over the place that are not coherence, that means like too random. It's about too many things. It's what you don't want to have in a topic, right? A topic to make sense. You remember that thing with cowboys and shooting? Everything with cowboys has shooting and horses and big hats, right? In Midwest, like that, that's how those movies go. So that's a good coherent topic because all those things are co-occurring. Co that's what he's saying. Yeah. So I wanna take the co-occurrence and I wanna say, I don't like topics that are on words that are not co-occurring with each other. Yes. All right, yeah. okay. So Wednesday we'll have a homework on, on topic modeling to LDA and NMF and sampling. But until then we still have to work on the tensor flow homework. Okay.